and welcome to Public Health Live, the third Thursday breakfast broadcast. I'm Rachel Breidster, and I'll be your moderator today. Before we get started, I would like to ask that you please fill out your online evaluation at the close of today's webcast. Continuing education credits are available after you complete our short post-test, and your feedback is helpful in planning future programs. We encourage you to let us know what topics are of interest to you and how we can best meet your needs. As for today's program, we will be taking your questions throughout the hour by phone. Our toll-free number is 1-800-452-0662, or you can email us questions at any time at phlive.ny at gmail.com. Please feel free to send your questions in at any time throughout the hour. Today's program is Healthy School Lunches, an integral part of the school day. Our guests are Margo Wutan from the Center for Science and Public Interest and Jessica Pino from Hunger Solutions New York. Thank you both so much for being here. We're very excited to have this conversation today. Thanks, Thanks for so having much. us. So Margo, we're going to be talking about school foods during this hour and I know that in recent years the landscape of what foods we have in schools has really been changing. So can you start off by just talking about what are some of the bigger changes that we've seen? There is so much happening on school foods. A lot of school districts have pulled together committees and developed local nutrition and physical activity wellness policies. States have passed policies, especially around getting soda and unhealthy foods out of vending and a la carte and school stores, the so-called competitive foods. And we worked with a lot of members of the National Alliance for Nutrition and Activity, or NANA, with Congress and with the Obama administration to pass the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act in 2010. So at the national, state, and local level, there's a lot of activity around school foods. So one of those things that you mentioned was the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, and that seems to be one of the driving forces behind some of the changes that are taking place. So can you tell us a little bit more about the details of that act and what its intent is, what it's doing? A lot of people know about the changes in school meal standards. That's what's happened so far and has been going into effect. But with the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, we were able to put into place a very comprehensive system of changes to help support healthier school nutrition environments. So there are the new school lunch and breakfast standards. There are also updated standards for the foods that are sold outside of the meal, so the competitive foods, vending, a la carte, school stores. There's more technical assistance and training. There are um, various mechanisms of trying to continue to improve the foods that USDA provides to schools for free through the commodities program. Mm -hmm. There's um, a number of different ways that schools are getting increased resources, bringing more money in to help fund the school lunch and breakfast program. And there are some provisions to strengthen the local wellness policies to make sure that those are implemented better and also to get parents more engaged with them to let them know about them. There are some transparency provisions. And then one of the other important sets of changes in the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act is to help ensure compliance with all these new standards, because it's not enough to just have the standards on paper. Right. We want to make sure that those are actually implemented, and so there are some changes in accountability and transparency. So it certainly sounds like a very comprehensive act. And when we're talking about obesity, I mean, I think in this day and age, we all recognize America has an obesity problem. But focusing efforts in the schools why are we doing that? I mean, is there reason to believe that children are exposed or more likely to become obese through the foods that they're eating in schools? Why are we targeting so many of our efforts there? It's not that we're blaming schools for causing obesity. It's that kids spend so much of their time at school. Sure. You know, after home, probably school is the next place where they spend most of their waking hours. And kids do a lot of eating at school. Some kids eat breakfast. Virtually all kids eat lunch. Younger kids eat a morning snack, some kids eat an aftercare, so after school. So overall, kids are eating about a third to a half of their calories at school on school days. One of the other nice things about focusing on school nutrition policies is it's not adding to the burden of schools. It's not asking them to do more, which is hard because schools are being asked to do more and more, which sure. oftentimes it seems less and less. But we're not asking schools to take on a new responsibility. We're just saying, you're already feeding kids. Instead of feeding them what you're feeding them now, try to make that food more healthful. Sure, and that certainly seems like a common sense approach. 
Now, one of the bigger changes we've seen is in meal patterns in the breakfast and lunch. So can you talk about what has, how has the meal changed in terms of what we're expected to be providing? So there are updated nutrition standards for school lunch and school breakfast, and those are being phased in gradually over time. What we'll end up with are school lunches that have double the amounts of fruits and vegetables, which is great because fruits and vegetables are something kids are not eating enough of. Sure. There'll be less of the bad stuff, less salt, less trans fat. Schools have already been working to reduce saturated fat, which will continue. The grains will need to be whole grain rich. They don't have to be 100% whole grain, but they'll need to be at least half whole grain. Okay. The milk needs to be low fat. And then importantly, USDA adjusted the calorie levels so that they address both hunger and obesity. We want to make sure that kids get enough to eat, but they're not overfed. Sure, which seems like maybe to be a, a tricky balance to achieve. There's been a little controversy about the calorie caps, and you hear about kids going hungry, and a lot of that has been political pushback because the calorie levels really are ample to provide for most kids' nutrition needs. And for a very active teenage boy, the calorie levels were never really high enough for them mm -hmm. anyway. They're going to need to buy an extra entree or side dish. You know, if a kid's eating 4,000 calories a day, no school lunch is going to take care of all those needs. Sure. Now, I would imagine that one of the concerns in changing these patterns and changing the standards is the cost. And is, is it reasonable to expect that schools can afford to implement these new changes? We've also heard some complaints about the cost. Mm -hmm. And from some school administrators and some policymakers who say this is an unfunded mandate, that we're asking school to make these changes and we're not providing them with ample resources. But this is far from an unfunded mandate. One thing that's different about school foods compared to other aspects of education policy and education programs is that the school lunch and breakfast programs are national programs. Most of the money comes from the federal government to the tune of, you know, somewhere around $13 billion a year. And so the nutrition standards are really just a condition of funding. If the federal taxpayers are going to provide schools with billions and billions of dollars, we want to make sure that that money's well spent. That's sure. just a matter of good government. Mm -hmm. So there are nutrition standards to make sure that this nutrition program actually provides nutritious food. And it's not unfunded. It's largely funded by the federal government. Sure. Now, getting back to that Hu Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, what other resources does that provide? So there are a couple of different ways that the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act try to enhance funding. Mm -hmm. And it's not all government money. Most people know about the six cent reimbursement. So if a school is meeting the new school lunch standards, then they get an extra six cents per lunch. So that's one direct source of funds. And it's also an incentive, which seems to be working very well to entice schools, to encourage schools to make sure that they're meeting the new lunch standards. And schools are doing great. About 80% or over 80% of school districts are already meeting or well on their way to meeting the standards and are getting that additional six cents. But it's not all up to government. Families also need to do their share. So middle and upper income families pay for their children's school lunch. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes schools were pricing those school lunches for middle and upper income families at a price that was lower than what it cost them to provide those meals. And so what would happen is money would be shifted from providing healthy foods for low income kids to lunches for upper income families. And that meant less resources for fruits and vegetables and whole grains for low income kids. So there's some provisions in Healthy Hunger Free Kids to make sure that schools are pricing the paid meals, the mm -hmm. meals for middle and upper income kids at a level that covers their costs. Sure. So that the money that's meant for low income kids goes there. The other pricing provision has to do with a la carte foods. You know, kids, in addition to buying a balanced school meal, can also buy pizza, mm -hmm. hamburgers, chicken sandwiches, french fries, other things, individually a la carte. 
And oftentimes schools are pricing those a la carte foods at lower than what it costs them to sell and serve those foods. And so money was also being drained away from providing healthy foods for low-income kids. So those two pricing strategies plus the six cents mm -hmm. all add up to significant additional resources to help pay for these healthy school meals. And it's fair because then parents do their share, the government does their share, and the cost is spread. And when we're looking over the course of a period of time, I mean, these initiatives and this push to make healthier implementation really doesn't end up as a deficit for the school, right? I mean, it kind of pays for itself. It shouldn't. Some schools are complaining that they're not able to serve the healthy school meals within the current reimbursement rate, but most schools can do it. So what that tells us is that we need to give technical assistance, training, and other support to those schools that are struggling mm -hmm. to serve healthy meals within budget so that they can do it. And there was actually a very bad provision in the um, omnibus appropriations bill that came out just this week from Congress, which, you know, the big spending bill that's mm -hmm. funding the whole government. And they're saying if a school can't provide healthy school meals within budget, they should be able to get a waiver. And what we say is we want all kids to have healthy foods. Yeah. If a school is struggling and they can't provide healthy food within budget, we need to help that school with budgeting, with procurement, with other technical assistance and training to make sure that they can serve healthy meals to all kids with the money that they have. Certainly, that seems to make sense. And are there ways that the USDA is helping schools to serve healthier meals? In addition to the financial resources, there's more training and technical assistance and support. It's not an easy job to try to feed hundreds of sure. kids in 20, 30 minutes. All the kids have you know, different tastes, different cultural backgrounds, and so to feed them healthy meals that they like and mm -hmm. will eat is a tough job. So we wanna make sure that we support schools in doing that. So USDA has some great resources. Also, the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act requires that schools are assessed more regularly to make sure that they are complying with the new school meal standards. So it used to be that schools were assessed only every five years. That's a pretty long time. Now it's down to every three years, oh, wow. which should help. So um, overall, there's this you know, comprehensive set of new standards, new resources, more TA, technical assistance, model product specifications for how to use your commodity foods better, a very comprehensive set of provisions mm -hmm. in Healthy Hunger Free Kids to really help every school district, every school serve healthy food to all their kids. So I mean, the picture you painted, there's a lot of resources in place, there's a lot happening. What more needs to be done? What are some of the challenges? Well, schools have a tough job. Um, for advocates and health professionals who want to get involved, schools could really use their support. Okay. One thing is if you're a state level advocate or professional would be to work with your state child nutrition program. So the child nutrition program is responsible for running the school lunch and breakfast programs and other child nutrition programs. Talk to them, work with them, find out what they need. I'm actually going over to meet with the New York State Child Nutrition Program today to find out how's it going? Mm -hmm. What do they need? Are they getting the training and support that they need? But that can really make a big difference. At the school level, schools have found it very helpful to engage children. You know, these days kids have a lot of opinions about oh, yeah. what they <laughs> want to eat, you know, from a very young age. And so we want to ask kids, you know, which entrees and side dishes, which fruits and vegetables do you like? Do some taste testing, have them vote, get them engaged in marketing the school lunch program to their friends so that school lunch becomes cool. We mm -hmm. want to make sure that the meals are appealing to kids and that they're willing to eat it. We don't want it to be a program where you know the kids think like, oh, that's healthy food that tastes bad that I don't yeah. want to eat. We have to engage kids to make school lunch cool because kids are used to seeing billions of dollars worth of marketing for McDonald's and Burger King and mm -hmm. Taco Bell. We want to make sure that they think that school lunch is also appealing and tastes great. And then getting parents engaged is also really important. A lot of parents 
don't realize how the school lunch program has changed. And so they think about school lunch as being something that's unappealing or unhealthy. They might not know that their kid's school lunch is really great, that it tastes good, that it's appealing. And so that way, parents will be more willing to have their kids buy school lunch. The more kids that participate in the program, the better it is for the program. We have a lot of resources on our website at schoolfoods.org slash back to school. And there are tips for parents, letters you could send home to them, letters you could send to your food service director thanking them for their hard work, and other materials to help engage parents and kids, school administrators, teachers, and others in supporting the school lunch program. Excellent. And you know, it's interesting you're talking about um, getting students' opinions. And last year we did a webcast um, in 2013 where we interviewed folks out in Binghamton. They have the Rock On Cafe, and we went out and talked to them about their process, and they do a taste testing, and it's been a tremendously successful program. Um, and that was a public health live that we have on our website um, that we did about a year ago. So oh, that sounds it's great. certainly been successful for them. I would imagine other schools could really benefit from a program like that as well. Yeah, kids expect to be a part of the process. They expect to have a say in the decisions about what they eat. Mm -hmm. And a school that's not that's you know has plate waste where the kids don't like the meal it's not that kids won't eat school lunch they just need to learn from those schools that are doing a great job mm -hmm. we actually have a great pinterest board with other members of the national alliance for nutrition and activity and if you're if you don't believe that school lunch can taste good look good and be healthy go to this pinterest board so just search for the center for science and the public interest and look for the school meals pinterest board and there are beautiful meals, which I would love to eat for lunch every Excellent. day. Excellent. So now we've been talking a lot about meals. One of the other issues are those competitive foods or other foods that make their way into the school setting. Can you talk a bit about those? There are a lot of foods sold outside the meal program. So there's vending, there's these a la carte foods where kids buy foods individually mm -hmm. instead of as a packaged meal in the cafeteria school stores, lots and lots of fundraisers that sell foods regularly. So one of the key provisions of the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, which we worked on for over a decade with Senator Harkin and others, um, will require the USDA to update the nutrition standards for all the foods that are sold outside the school meal program on the school campus during the school day. So it doesn't cover like a football game on a Friday night okay. or a fundraiser that the kids might bring home and sell to their neighbors, but it affects all the food that's sold on campus during the school day. So USDA updated those standards, they came out this summer, and they go into effect in the coming school year. So the foods that are sold outside of meals will have to meet standards for fat, salt, sugar, calories, and really importantly, the food will also have to be food. You know, it won't yeah. only have to be low in the bad stuff, but it'll need to be a fruit, a vegetable, a whole grain. It'll have to provide something nutritious to kids. And so um, this will be a shift for some schools that don't have standards, but for a lot of schools, they've already been working on this. Okay. Um, and then on the beverage side, mm -hmm. um, in elementary and middle schools, schools will only be able to sell water, juice, and low-fat milk. And then in high schools, they'll also be able to sell low-calorie beverages. So about 60 calories per 12-ounce container. So for those states that already have policies, which there are probably about a dozen that have pretty comprehensive policies for competitive foods, they're gonna need to reconcile their current policy with the national policy. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that'll mean just little tweaks. Maybe they didn't have a sodium standard and now they'll have to have one. And in other cases, it'll take a little more work. So one thing that public health advocates can do is to work with their state child nutrition program to help schools get ready for the new standards and to help reconcile their existing competitive food standards with the new national standards. So one of the things that you mentioned was the fundraisers, you know, that you're not necessarily talking about fundraisers where kids take things and they're selling them at home. And certainly I remember when I was in school, a big part of fundraising is bake sales or you get those that box of candy that you bring home and you're selling chocolate bars to everyone. Um, what, what are your thoughts or what are the policies on fundraising? 
So the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act does cover fundraisers those fundraisers that are on campus mm -hmm. during the school day. So if you're selling cookie dough at home on the weekends to your neighbors, that's not covered. A local wellness policy or a state policy could cover that. But, um, but USDA is allowing for some exemptions. The number of exemptions will be determined by every state. So that's another thing at the state level. States will need to decide how many exemptions are they going to allow to the nutrition standards for fundraisers. They could choose to do one a semester, two a year. It'll really be up to them. The fundraising provision has been a little more controversial than the rest of the competitive food standards. I think we've gotten to a point where everybody thinks soda and candy bars should come out of vending machines. But fundraisers, I don't know, people have a little bit of nostalgia or they think they're so essential. Like our education system will falter <laughs> if we don't have a bake sale to, you know, to raise funds. Um, but there are lots of healthy fundraisers and a lot of these unhealthy fundraisers are really not as great a fundraiser as you might think. You know, you're used to doing the bake sale, that's what you've always done. But I have to say, as both a nutritionist and a mom, <laughs> I can't stand bake sales. <laughs> you know, as a nutritionist, I don't like the high calorie fat, mm -hmm. trans fat, saturated fat, um, and sugar content. You know, these uh, sweet baked goods are a real problem in Americans' diets and in children's diets in particular. So nutritionally, bake sales are not good for kids. But also financially and practically, they don't make any sense. You know, as a mom, I have to buy a a mix for brownies or actually go buy cupcakes, make them, and then I have to send them to school with money with my daughter so she can buy them back. Like, you know, there are definitely more effective and certainly healthier ways to raise funds for schools. And so what are some of the ideas, what are some of the things that you would recommend as an alternative, both that might be more practical but also healthier? There are tons of healthy options. A lot of times it's just a matter of trying them out. We've looked at dozens of fundraisers and pulled together a list of companies that have healthy fundraising options in a report called Sweet Deals, which people can find on our website. We have information in the back of over 60 companies that sell healthy foods or even better non-food options. So there are things like bottled water sales where schools can get a local business to sponsor the water bottle and put their corporate logo on it or put the school logo on it. Schools are selling calendars, greeting cards, Christmas trees, candles, jewelry, clothing, personal care products. Um, there are book fairs. There are Grocery and other retail stores have gift card programs where a school keeps a cut of what people pay for the gift card. And one of the great fundraising options that schools have made a lot of money on and that's good for kids are physical activity mm -hmm. fundraisers. Bolathons, walkathons, 10K, 5K runs that those physical activity fundraisers are great for kids and families and get them physically active, but also raise a lot of money. Um, these changes in fundraising, you know, some people might think, oh, it's not that big a deal, that, you know, an occasional fundraiser, it's just, you know, it, it's not that big a contributor to obesity or to poor diets. But many families don't realize, many parents don't realize how many fundraisers there are in schools. That it could be almost every day that one club is selling mm -hmm. Krispy Kreme donuts on the way in at breakfast time, or they're selling pizza at lunchtime, they're selling candy bars and other things regularly during the school day. The other thing is the message that it sends to kids. You know, kids aren't getting enough nutrition education to begin with, mm -hmm. and then we undermine that nutrition education by telling them, well, if you need money, it's okay to sell unhealthy foods. That enlisting children to sell unhealthy products to their friends and family or to sell those products in schools sends the message to kids that good nutrition isn't important. Sure, sure. Now. <clears throat> In addition to the policies on nutrition, uh, many school districts have policies on physical activity and wellness. Does the Healthy Hunger-Free Kids Act affect those policies? 
So since 2004, there's been a provision in place to have schools develop and implement nutrition and physical activity wellness policies. Those policies are great for a number of reasons. They're good for implementing policies that are already in place at the national and state level. So if the state has PE standards, the local wellness policy can be a good way to implement those standards. They're also good for developing local policies around things that aren't addressed at the national and state level, things like recess or food marketing in schools or rewards and parties that local policy might be the only policy or might be the best way to address some of those issues. So in the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, there are some provisions to strengthen the local wellness policies, especially around implementation. We find a lot of schools have pretty good wellness policies on the books, but they're not always implemented, especially at the school building level. So there might be a district policy on a website or in a drawer somewhere, <laughs> but actually making sure that that policy gets implemented at each school is really important. So making sure there's a teacher or a committee or the PTA that's implementing that policy in each school is really important. Making sure that the school has an implementation plan, that the, that the wellness policy is communicated to school administrators mm -hmm. and teachers and parents. One of the provisions of Healthy Hunger Free Kids is a transparency provision to make sure that the local wellness policy is communicated to parents so that they know what they should be expecting from their school around nutrition and physical activity. That's fantastic. Um, now, another concern is the marketing, right? So even if we are trying to encourage students to be eating healthy, you know, we're designing healthier school lunches, we're trying to get students more physically active and, and bringing those policies to life. What about all of the marketing that kids are exposed to, even in vending machines and things of that nature? Kids are exposed to a lot of food marketing, about $2 billion worth a year. There's a lot of marketing, and unfortunately, most of it is for unhealthy foods. Mm -hmm. Studies show it clearly affects children's food preferences, their food choices, their diets, and their health. And the marketing in schools is especially a problem. I mean, it should be a place that is cultivating and teaching kids, you know, cultivating good eating habits, teaching kids about nutrition education, and if instead it's giving kids the message that good nutrition isn't important, that really can undermine children's diets for the long term. There's marketing through a lot of different venues, the fundraisers, which we've already talked about, mm -hmm. but also educational materials and curricula, posters and signs, the fronts of vending machines. You know, the vending machines are not only dispensing unhealthy food, but they're billboards <laughs> yeah. for Coke or Pepsi or Gatorade that kids are walking past every day. There are label redemption programs mm -hmm. like Campbell's Labels for Education, incentive programs like the Pizza Hut Book Program. All of these things are marketing. And the goal for the companies are to cultivate brand loyalty and cultivate children's food preferences so they prefer these foods over other foods. Um, food marketing can be addressed at the local level through local wellness policies, through a school board policy, or at the state level through legislation or regulation or through the State Board of Education. Change Lab Solutions has a great model policy and we have a lot of fact sheets backgrounders, tip sheets, and ideas about how to switch to, um, how to remove the unhealthy food marketing from schools. Excellent, I'm sure that's very helpful. Um, now one of the other things to take into consideration is some of the ways that we use food in the schools, and probably at home as well, but using food as a reward. Can you talk about concerns that you have of, about using food as a reward? You know, some people will say, oh, a little piece of candy every once in a while or a pizza party, isn't that fun? Don't kids deserve that? It's a part of childhood. But cultivating, that using food as a reward really cultivates a bad relationship for children with food over the long term. <coughs> There's a reason why, you know, many of us want ice cream when we're happy, <laughs> when we're sad, when we're celebrating. And so we don't want to create these 
bad connections between food and mood with children early on, and food rewards can do that. There are lots of other ways to treat children and to reward them for good behavior or for, um, or for doing a good job academically. We have a lot of tips on our website um, at cspinet.org or schoolfoods.org on how to reward children. And a lot of times kids like praise and other kinds of rewards even better, that they can be more effective and they're certainly better for children's health. Um, yeah, and I can remember even when I was in school when the list would come out who had made the honor roll or high honor roll, everyone went out to ice cream afterwards. I mean, that was what we did to celebrate and it does sort of become this when you accomplish something. You go out to eat, you go celebrate with some kind of food. So it is interesting how that starts at a young age and then translates into later in life. Yeah, I mean, praise, social rewards, recognition, you mm -hmm. know, getting the sash for being the, having the highest math grade or getting a button that says, you know, you've done great, getting stamps on the back of their hands, getting little other kinds of trinkets. You know, oftentimes candy is not that special for kids mm -hmm. anymore because they're, you know, giving out Jolly Ranchers left and right. Sure, sure. Um, and what about parties in schools? You know, there's, we have the Halloween parties, there's birthday parties, there's all, it always seems there's always a party celebrating something. What are your thoughts on that? You know, I don't want to be accused of being the cupcake police because <laughs> I do believe in, you know, having a birthday cake. My daughter always had a birthday cake, you know, for her birthday growing up. But the parties have just gotten out of hand. You know, there are so many celebrations at schools, especially this is a problem in elementary schools, mm -hmm. where you have, you know, 20, 25 students, and then every single holiday you can possibly think of, you know. I mean, Halloween, you, Valentine's Day, you expect, but it's Dr. Seuss's birthday, it's the 100th <laughs> day of school, it's VIP day, and everyone is an excuse for cupcakes. A birthday ends up meaning a party at school, party at aftercare, a party with their friends, a party with family. So, you know, one cupcake or one piece of cake would be fine and would be a very nice celebration. But four cakes, you know, gets to be a lot of work for parents and also starts to undermine children's health. And then each party ends up getting a bit out of hand. You know, at schools these days, a lot of times it's not just cupcakes. It's also a sugary juice drink, pizza, Cheetos, and a little candy goodie bag that goes home. So we recommend that schools find alternative ways of celebrating children's birthdays. You know, and it depends on the kid's age and what the kid's like, but kids love extra recess, or they can have a birthday sash or a birthday crown or a pin. My daughter used to love to be the line leader. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, they could <laughs> eat lunch with the teacher for the day. That We need to find other ways to reward and treat children. That, you know, it may seem like a party every once in a while is not that big a deal, but it really gets at the heart of how we use food with children mm -hmm. and how often we do. And we need to make treats, treats again. You know, rather than having treats all the time, you know, oftentimes it's a pastry at breakfast, a cookie at lunch, dessert after dinner, all these parties, all these rewards. We need to make treats special again and have them occasionally so that when we do, we really enjoy them. And teaching children that from a young age is really important. So as our listeners are taking all of this in and looking to start making some of the changes you've suggested, are there resources you'd like to share to <clears throat> help folks implement some of these changes in their own lives and work? Absolutely. Um, for school wellness policies, the National Alliance for Nutrition and Activity developed a model wellness policy and gathered a lot of resources together at this website at schoolwellnesspolicies.org. And then we have a lot of other resources on our website at cspinet.org. There's a nutrition policy section and all the school foods policies I talked about today we have backgrounders, fact sheets, model policies, and then also on a whole other range of policies on restaurant foods and healthy food on government property and other issues. We have resources that we've developed at the Center for Science and the Public Interest, but also resources that other coalition partners have developed that we just think are good resources. So if someone else has done it, we don't necessarily do it again, but we'll try to put it on our website. Also, we're available to provide some technical assistance and support 
to folks working on state and local school foods policies. I'd also just point you to some of our social media. Mm -hmm. We have a Facebook page, which not only has a lot of good policy information, but also just practical tips. So if you're interested in good recipes and how to eat better, um, follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And then I had mentioned our Pinterest mm -hmm. board, which has some great pictures of healthy, appealing school lunches, also some great recipes. So we are um, there through social media as well. So just, you know, go to Facebook, Twitter, or Pinterest and search for the Center for Science and the Public Interest. Great. Margo, thank you so much for everything that you've shared with us today. We are going to hear from Jessica about her work as a child nutrition program specialist. But before we do, let's hear first from our commissioner of the New York State Department of Health on the importance of having this conversation and talking about nutrition in our schools here in New York State. All right, so Dr. Shaw, why should we be addressing nutrition in schools? Schools have long been identified as the ideal setting for obesity prevention efforts. Children spend more time in school than in any other environment outside the home. In New York State, overweight and obesity affect fully 40% of public school students in New York City between the ages of 6 and 12, and 32% of students in the rest of the state. 31% of New York children ages 2 to 4 enrolled in the Special Supplemental Program for Women, Infants, and Children, or WIC, are overweight or obese. So why would you say that a healthy nutrition environment in schools is important? Children are establishing healthy habits that will last a lifetime. School environments should make it easy for children to make the healthy choice so that those behaviors become the default. School environments model what children learn about good nutrition in health science and other classes. And schools play an important role in children's health by adopting and implementing policies and regulations that support healthful eating environments for students and staff. Creating healthy school environments is a team effort with coordination among school administration, students, staff, parents, and members of the community. What would you say is the connection or is there a connection between nutrition and learning? The strongest evidence is around breakfast. Eating breakfast regularly is associated with improved cognitive function, academic achievement, and school attendance. There's also strong evidence linking severe iron deficiency with poor academic performance. There's also evidence that suggests consuming fewer sugary drinks, more milk, and more vitamins and minerals is linked to better academic performance. Don't you think, though, that children should have the option to choose between healthful and unhealthful foods to help prepare them for making choices in the future? A study conducted prior to the changes made by the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act of 2010 showed that about a third of calories children consume in schools are empty calories, those from fat and added sugars. The top three sources of added fats and sugars were sugary drinks, grain desserts, such as cookies and cupcakes and high-fat milks, and pizza was also a big contributor. The same study showed that about a third of calories consumed from fast food restaurants and stores were also empty. Schools should be a place that allows students to practice the healthy behaviors they learn in the classroom. So when it comes to nutrition, what interventions do you think can be made to improve health in public schools? You know, our prevention agenda has a goal that by December 31st, 2017, we want to increase the number of school districts whose competitive food policies meet or exceed the Institute of Medicine recommendations for healthy food. Interventions that we consider include incorporating time into the school day so that students have adequate time to eat nutritious lunches and snacks. Increasing the number of schools that establish strong nutritional standards for all foods and beverages sold and provided through schools, such as establishing sugary drink policies, promoting access to free drinking water, and adopting Institute of Medicine nutrition standards for school foods sold and served outside of the federal child nutrition programs. There are significant short-term and long-term benefits to making healthier foods a high priority in our schools. To be successful, it will require a truly collaborative effort with public health, school administrators, principals, school food service, teachers, and parents. So Jessica, you've been sitting here patiently the whole time, and um, I appreciate you being here. 
Can you start by talking about your role at Hunger Solutions New York as a child nutrition program specialist? Yes, thanks so much for having me. Sure. Um, so Hunger Solutions New York is a statewide anti-hunger organization. Um, so in the context of school meals, we recognize that hungry kids um, are at a disadvantage to their peers um, in terms of physical, social, and academic um, advantages. So um, we're concerned with we want to ensure that where children learn and where children play and grow, um, that they are getting access to the nutri nutritious foods that they need um, to be successful. And what about the school breakfast program? I mean, that's one of the focuses that you're going to talk about today. How is that program utilized? Are people as aware of it as they should be? Is it getting the usage that it's intended to have? So the school breakfast program is one of the programs that we focus on because it's so underutilized in New York State. So when we look at school breakfast, com school lunch participation versus school breakfast, nearly 1.6 million students across the state access lunch, whereas breakfast, we're looking at about 596,000 students. So you can see that there's a significant disparity between the participation rates. Um, so we really, and also we're really concerned with um, low income participation particularly. Mm -hmm. And to be clear, we're talking about the number of students across New York State who access breakfast through the school breakfast program, is that correct? Correct, so we're talking about the federally funded school breakfast program um, that Margot, Margot talked about a little bit earlier. Um, over, in terms of overall enrollment, um, one in five um, students in New York State participate in the school breakfast program. Mm -hmm. When we look particularly at low income students, 1.6 million students across the state qualify for free and reduced price school meals. Okay. So that includes both lunch and breakfast. Mm -hmm. um, only one in three of those students participate in the program. And then when we take a closer look at their low income participation, um, we see that of the students, for every 100 students that receive a free and reduced price lunch, only 44 receive that free and reduced price breakfast. So technically, we, we would like to see 100% of those low-income kids accessing both those healthy meals to ensure that they're fueled up and ready to learn. Um, and so FRAC does a ranking of how are states doing when re in reaching our low-income kids. New York State ranks 41st um, among all the states. So this is definitely a, an area of concern. Yeah, so I mean, saying 44 out of 100, I mean, there seems to be a lag there and a disparity that we'd like to encourage. Can you talk about that, that ranking, that we're 41st in the nation? What does that mean? What does that translate to? Right, so our, our partners at Food Research and Action Center, FRAC, um, are, are releasing a school breakfast scorecard actually this coming week and gave us a special preview of, of the results there. And we're, con we're still, we're at that 44% of reaching low-income kids. Um, and they break it out, they set goals for states. And mm -hmm. if states were to receive that, <coughs> were to get to a 70 to 100 ratio, um, that means that an additional over two, 320 students would eat every day, this is low income students, and bringing in an additional $78.5 million in child nutrition funding for the school breakfast program. So what we really like to talk about is every day a low income kid does not eat breakfast. Um, federal and state potential funding is left on the table. So. And, and in that same ranking, New York State was identified as one of the top states to forfeit the most federal funding due to lack of participation. So financially, we could really benefit by increasing those right, numbers. There's dollars out there to help feed kids. So Now, you've been talking so far about the underutilization of the school breakfast program, but would you say that regardless of income and regardless of whether it's the school breakfast or breakfast in general, are children missing out? I mean. Are we achieving a, a desirable rate of children who are actually eating breakfast? That's a great point. It's not just a trend for low-income kids. Regardless of income level, um, national surveys have shown us that one in five kids and one in three teens, regardless of income, are missing out on school breakfast for various reasons. Um, this statistic is really important. It underscores the importance of the school breakfast program and the opportunity that schools really have to um, make sure that kids are getting a nutritious start to their day and having a balanced breakfast. Um, so we're strongly encouraging schools to focus on their participation in their school breakfast programs and set goals to increase the number of kids accessing breakfast. A review of over 50 studies that appeared in um, the Journal of School Health in September of 2011 points to a, a growing research that skipping breakfast really hurts children 
um, in their overall cognitive performance. It really affects their, their alertness levels, attention, memory, problem solving, mathematical skills. So really schools have a unique opportunity with the school breakfast program to strategically support student achievement by making sure, again, that they're accessing this meal. So it certainly seems like there's the research to support the idea that, hey, if we want children to be eating breakfast because they're going to do better in a number of different ways. Have you identified what some of the barriers are as to why students say they're not eating breakfast? Right. So there, the USDA has done studies and evaluations of, of their programs and have recognized that there are barriers that are part of life, right? Early morning busy schedules, um, just the rush in the morning. Mm -hmm. I know I eat my breakfast in the car ride down <laughs> to my commute. Um, but also, these studies really showed us that there are barriers in our schools that, that can be addressed, like tight morning bus schedules. Um, there's really not enough time where kids have time to get off the bus and actually get that meal service. Um, pressure to get to class on time, those are also real, real things that kids face every morning. Also the stigma that school breakfast is only for low income kids. And that's, that's something that is always constantly trying to break down that barrier that it is a program for all children. Um, but schools are recognizing these barriers and um, understanding that there's things that they can do within their, their particular building um, to make it easier for schools to um, access these programs. And what are some of the things that schools are doing? Because certainly, you know, you mentioned the pressure to get to class on time. Well, obviously, we want students to get to class on time, you know, so we can't necessarily eliminate that, right? But so what are some of the ways to work around it? What are schools doing? Right. Um, well, what we find has been key um, is making breakfast um, accessible, making an opportunity to, to have breakfast. So a key part of this is moving breakfast out of the traditional approach of serving it in the cafeteria 10-15 mm -hmm. minutes before school. Um, schools see that they have to have at least five lunch periods to serve all their, their student population lunch, whereas there's a 10-15 minute window for that breakfast meal to happen. So moving that, the breakfast out of the cafeteria has really been a proven tactic to increase participation um, and really so, so schools are implementing some really tried, true, and effective ways um, to implement breakfast outside of, a outside of the cafeteria. And making it kind of part of the school day, is that the, the new approach? Yes, so, so really integrating, like, like lunch, mm -hmm. um, making breakfast a part of the school day is really a key to success, um, a part of these models that schools are implementing. Um, <clears throat> many of these models are considered breakfast after the bell. So really embracing that idea that it's part of the school day. But each, each model has been adop adopted to meet the spe specific and unique needs of each building and each classroom. But they generally fall into these three categories of breakfast in the classroom. So breakfast in the classroom, um, meals are served directly to kids um, in that first 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes in the classroom. So when, especially elementary school kids, when they're getting ready um, for the day and morning announcements are happening, mm -hmm. they're eating at that same time. Um, parents, teachers find that it's a much easier transition than um, trying to get out of the cafeteria, of the cafeteria into, the into and, and it really calms the morning for, um, for kids. Classroom breakfast has been really successful. Um, Under Secretary Kevin Concanon from the USDA has recognized breakfast in the classroom as one of the most promising approaches for, uh, for expanding school breakfast in the country. Some other options that schools have adopted are grab and go. Um, it, this is where a kiosk is set up in a, in a hallway or in a lobby where kids can pick up a, a bagged breakfast mm -hmm. um, and at that point eat on their way to, uh, on their way to class or eat in the homeroom. Um, and then another option is breakfast after first period. So opening your cafeteria for breakfast after that um, initial time. It's really ideal for high school students to incorporate a morning meal into their routine. Now you mentioned that some of these alternative ways of serving breakfast, you called them tried, true, and effective. Can you elaborate on what you mean by that? Yeah, um, so our Share Our Strength um, is a national anti-hunger group that really looks at breakfast after our after the bell and um, has done evaluations of the program has found that not only have these programs increased participation but also have seen larger impacts improving student alertness, alertness um, less visits to the school nurse, less discipline, 
discipline problems, um, and positive impacts on attendance. Um, just this recent weekend, we actually saw a local school, Schenectady City School District, um, talk about how recently implement, implementing free school meals, and in addition, they're also doing these, these programs, Breakfast in the Classroom, um, in all their elementary schools, and Grab and Go, and um, in their middle and high schools, um, and they have seen a dramatic increase in their attendance. It's jumped from 35% or excuse me, 58% of their kids per attending 90% of the time to 91% of their kids in just one year. Wow. Um, so it's a great article to really show a local district that's doing great work. Yeah, that's those are very, you know, eye-catching numbers. That's terrific. Now, as schools are working to implement these changes into their own districts, are there resources or recommendations that you would like to share with our listeners? Yes. We would love to, for schools to really look at their participation in their districts set goals for improvement, and, and that starts by making breakfast part of the school day. Really expanding accessibility, availability, and participation in the school breakfast program is one of the best ways to um, support the health and academic potential of students across New York State. So making breakfast part of the school day, schools can implement local policy to address breakfast service. Um, some, districts, some districts can argue that serving breakfast just so having breakfast just part of their local wellness policy might not be strong enough that some schools have implemented board level policy to make sure that um, breakfast is really raised to that standard and made sure that it's important. But also people have found success in having um, school wellness policies incorporate breakfast. But some examples of what those policies include is um, requiring all their schools in their district to offer school breakfast. In New York State, the state legislation requires high-need schools, so if schools have 40% or above free and reduced um, price percentage of children, um, they, they are required under state legislation to, to operate the program. However, they can opt out of the program by showing disinterest. So I think strong local pol policy level can help address that and making sure that districts are taking it upon themselves to have all their schools operate school breakfast. Um, and then also those policies can incorporate those innovative models that we were talking about, breakfast in the classroom, um, <coughs> for example. Also providing universally free breakfast is really a great way um, to help kids get access to breakfast. And providing breakfast to all children at, at no cost, are there benefits to doing that? Definitely, so, so schools that ha use this universal approach where all school meals are free um, or or just breakfast have seen boosts in participation, um, really, really addressing stigma and mm -hmm. making sure that making it a part of the school culture that everyone eats, um, and then also it, it really optimizes switching that into those alternative models like breakfast in the classroom. It makes it easier to run those programs, um, and then also they ha have had links where schools offer free breakfast to all students. Um, they've seen improvements in academic performance as well. Great. Now, I want to make sure we do have a few questions. I want to make sure we have time to get to them. So if you could quickly talk about the community eligibility programs and the, the cost of offering universal breakfast. Sure. Um, universe, uh, community eligibility is a new provision that happened under the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. Um, it is a comprehensive provision, um, but it's a great option for um, high need schools to offer free meals to all their kids. Just a snapshot of New York State, 67 schools participate, uh, 416 individual school buildings um, operate community eligibility. And really the idea and the goal of community eligibility is to allow high poverty schools to feed more students and to focus on meal quality rather than paperwork. So with, with community eligibility and how it works, um, this, this is not based on a percentage of free and reduced price kits. So this is the percentage of low-income kids, so and kids that are directly certified for free school meals. And okay. what that means is that schools um, who live in households that receive TANF, SNAP, um, Medicaid, FDPIR, and then also who are homeless, migrant, or foster care, or in Head Start, those are directly certified um, for free school meals, those children. So schools must meet a 40% um, threshold of, of the identified students. Um, and then from there, schools can choose to implement community eligibility either district-wide 
within buildings or within groupings of buildings. So this has been a really powerful option. Schenectady, that one mentioned earlier, has been um, utilizing this option to offer free school meals to all their kids. So it's a really, really has shown success already in New York State. We're excited to see it continue to expand nationwide. Excellent. And I know on the screen just a moment ago there was contact information. Are there are you, do you welcome viewers to get in touch with yes, you? Yes, please get in touch, especially technical assistance around community eligibility or more information about those alternative models that we talked about. Love, we'd love to talk more. Excellent, thank you so much for all the information. This is such a rich topic. Um, one of the questions that came in asked, do the new guidelines take into account food allergies or special diets such as being vegan? Um, and this came in from New York City. So the nutrition standards really lay out which kinds of foods, like which food groups, how much fruit, vegetable, protein, whole grain, then it's up to the school district okay. itself to decide which foods to serve. And so usually school districts look at those kinds of issues, some individually, you know, if a child has severe allergies, mm -hmm. and some culturally, you know, in some school districts, like they're kosher. going to, right, they, they're going to look at what the needs are, what the interests are of their student population and try to match it. So deciding about issues like that are really more at the school district level. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, school breakfasts have a reputation for not being very healthful. Is that really the case? I think, I think what's really, there's always a great opportunity to connect with your schools. I think Margot did a really great job of talking about how the nutrition standards have really, really come up to par. And especially in 2014-15 school year, we're going to see even more improvements in the school breakfast program. So um, I really encourage parents, I encourage um, community members, if you're interested in what's serving, what's going on at school, to get in contact with your local schools and find out. Sometimes what we think would be a, a white bagel that's served in a breakfast in the classroom, it, it could be a whole, it is a whole grain rich bagel um, because it's meet, it needs to meet those requirements that are set forth in the program. And actually schools are generally meeting in the past have had an easier time meeting nutrition standards for breakfast than for lunch. Oh, interesting. So we'll see what happens with the new nutrition standards because the breakfast standards are still being phased in. Mm -hmm. They're not fully implemented. Well, thank you both so much for being here. I think this was a wonderful pro program with a lot of great information for our viewers. Thanks for having us. Great, thanks so much. Sure. And thank you very much for joining us today. Please remember to fill out your evaluations online. Your feedback is always helpful to the development of our programs and continuing education credits are available. To obtain nurse continuing education hours, CME, and CHES credits, learners must visit www.phlive.org and complete an evaluation and the post-test for today's offering. Additional information on upcoming broadcasts and relevant public health topics can also be found on our Facebook page. Don't forget to like us on Facebook to stay up to date. And always, as a reminder, you can download the companion guide to this webcast on our website, phlive.org. The companion guide provides you with learning activities to help further your knowledge and understanding of topics covered in today's program. This webcast will be available on demand on our website within two weeks, and DVDs of any of our Public Health Live webcasts can be ordered from our website as well. Please join us for our next webcast on March 20th on Comprehensive School Physical Activity Programs. I'm Rachel Breidster. Thank you so much for joining us today on Public Health Live.